good evening and at the onset i would like to thank dr rajiv chawla and dr shalini jaggi for this very kind introduction am i audible yes yes you are audible yeah yeah thank you and i thank you very much dr kurana for that very kind introduction i am going to talk on this uh, very important topic which we see in clinical practice uh, management of diabetes in patients with uh, chronic uh, liver disease cirrhosis of liver i focus on cirrhosis of liver yeah cirrhosis of liver is associated with diabetes and we see it very very frequently if you see the prevalence it's 15 to 50% patients have diabetes mellitus Uh, and prevalence of diabetes in patient with cld is reportedly 18 to 71% glucose intolerance being 80% with cld and diabetes being 30 to 60% so you can imagine the association is very very high and in patient with liver cirrhosis glucose intolerance and diabetes together can present in almost 96% of the patients and this is the global data and from southeast asia you can imagine it's almost 57.9% it's very very high from our uh, own region so diabetes and chronic liver disease uh, ne- it negatively affects the development and progression of chronic liver disease of various etiologies and concurrent diabetes and cld are also associated with worse clinical outcomes with respect to mortality the occurrence of hepatic decompensation and the development of hepatocellular carcinoma so you can imagine the uh, consequences of complications of cld in patients with diabetes unfortunately early diagnosis and optimal treatment of diabetes can be challenging due to lack of established clinical guidelines as well as the medical complexity of this patient population and cirrhosis is largely associated with diabetes and i said almost 80 to 90% of the patients have diabetes mellitus or some form of glucose intolerance so there could be something called as hepatogenic diabetes and hepatogenic diabetes is characterized by development of hyperinsulinemia insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction and all these three leading to glucose intolerance and diabetes in patients uh, who are basically having uh, chronic liver disease but they are non diabetic so this is the basically pathophysiology behind hepatogenic diabetes and the clinical difference between the hepatogenous diabetes and type 2 diabetes mellitus is that hepatogenous diabetes mellitus is after the cirrhosis onset and type 2 diabetes is before cirrhosis onset clinical presentation could be normal hpg and hba1c and abnormal ogtt as i said through simple uh, glucose intolerance and uh, diabetic patients have uh, diabetic range of fasting and hba1c it is less frequent uh, hepatogenic diabetes type 2 diabetes is more frequent vascular complication is less frequent liver complications are more frequent whereas liver complications are less frequent so these are few important differences between hepatogenous diabetes and uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus with cld and this is how we can actually we need to uh, make a good diagnosis before proceeding for treatment implications of diabetes in uh, liver cirrhosis is very very important because of the different studies which we have the randomized studies the cross sectional studies the case control studies which all uh, categorically uh, warn that hepatic encephalopathy and severe hepatic encephalopathy is much higher in diabetics compared to non diabetics with the liver cirrhosis complications of diabetes in cld would be hepatic encephalopathy in decompensated liver disease it could be parietal hemorrhages that could be the early sign hepatocellular carcinoma especially with patients who have uh, associated hep- uh, hepatitis c virus or hepatitis b virus associated with diabetes and chronic liver disease even the mortality is very very high many studies have indicated that diabetes significantly reduces the survival rate in patient with cld and liver cirrhosis so this is again very very interest uh, important to understand that patients with cld as should be very very intensively monitored and under clo- uh, treated under closed observation in a team of uh, gastroenterologist hepatologist or uh, and diabetologist liver transplantation is another important issue in uh, that uh, again leads to increased fasting plasma glucose levels as a risk factors for new onset diabetes after liver transplant so post transplant uh, post liver transplant 
diabetes is also a common associate. Pre-transplant diabetes is a major risk factor for diabetes after liver transplant. And post-liver transplant diabetes is associated with increased risk of graft rejection, severe complications and mortality. So again, this is very, very important entity which we need to understand in clinical practice. The management of diabetes in patients with liver disease is theoretically complicated by liver-related alterations in drug metabolism, potential interaction between the drugs, and low albeit real inc uh, incidence of hepatotoxicity. At the same time, there are drugs which are bound to the plasma proteins, especially drugs like sulfonylurea, and patients with chronic liver disease tend to have hypoproteinemia, and there the free drug levels can be high, and that free uh, drug levels can be a uh, uh, risk for getting hypo uh, causing hypoglycemia in those patients. So it is very, very important. And drug-to-drug -drug interaction also becomes very, very crucial. So these are the important causes, uh, NFLD, NASH, alcohol, viral infection, especially hepatitis C and hepatitis B virus, hypothyroidism, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, autoimmune hepatitis. So these are few common uh, uh, causes for uh, chronic liver disease in a diabetes. So whenever you have an abnormal liver enzymes, apart from uh, lab before labeling them as nice right, because of diabetes, we should rule out other causes, uh, which are very, very easily can be ruled out. History of alcohol can be ruled out. Viral infection by doing hepatitis B and hepatitis C markers can be ruled out. Hypothyroidism by doing a TSH, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, and autoimmune hepatitis all can be ruled out before labeling them NASH and diabetes. This is the pathophysiology is by activation of hepatic steroid cells, inflammation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, hepatic sinusoidal capillarization. These are basically the uh, step uh, which actually leads to the twin cycle hypothesis of type 2 diabetes is basically a positive calorie balance versus which actually leads to pre-existing muscle uh, insulin resistance in, at the level of muscles, which increases the uh, liver fat. And this liver fat actually causes a resistance to insulin suppression of glucose production, increases the basal insulin secretion, again, hyperinsulinemia. So all these things become a vicious cycle and the increased liver fat basically increases the VLDL triglyceride, increases islet triglyceride, and decreases the insulin response to ingested glucose in the pancreas. So it, that increases the uh, postprandial glucose and plasma glucose. So this becomes a twin cycle, uh, which is a uh, very, very interesting pathophysiology behind both uh, diabetes and CLD. So management, we should target uh, plasma glucose as fasting between 90 and 130, postprandial is less than 180, and uh, HbA1c 6.5 to 7.5, depending upon the compensated versus decompensated uh, liver disease. This is very, very important. And you should try to uh, educate, our, uh, educate our patients that this is what we are looking forward and we need to monitor very, very closely. Compensated cirrhosis uh, basically needs lifestyle measures, physical activity, and that uh, this, uh, stage can be managed with oral drugs and insulin as per the requirement. So compensated cirrhosis is one where you will not find uh, complications like ascites or uh, uh, varicell bleed or patients will not have like hepatic encephalopathy or anasarca hypoalbuminemia. They can have minor uh, signs and symptoms like spider nevi, uh, palmar uh, arrhythmias and uh, uh, clinical uh, early clinical signs of uh, liver cirrhosis and, and, and hepat uh, hepatic splenomegaly in ultrasonography. So the important uh, things here is to abstain from the general measures which you su suggest to all my patients is abstain from alcohol, immunization, like vaccination for hepatitis A virus and hepatitis B virus, pneumococcal vaccination, influenza vaccination, even uh, DPT booster scales should be given, modify risk factors for cardiovascular disease like hypertension and hyperlipidemia, and optimization of blood glucose control and weight loss. So these are the general measures which should be followed in almost all patients of diabetes with chronic liver disease at uh, this level. Uh, this is, uh, we are going to have a series of case, uh, the same case, how it follows in the clinics and how we pick them up. 
is a 38 year old male non diabetic for 2 years body mass index is 34 kg per meter square has a recurrent uh, history of recurrent anemia is non alcoholic no history of hypertension is has a dyslipidemia with a total cholesterol of 225 with an hdl cholesterol of 32 triglycerides 325 and ldl cholesterol 104 his hemoglobin is 8.5 and uh, kft is normal fasting 180 with pp 286 stool for occult blood was positive for uh, when he was evaluated for anemia and his usg abdomen was suggestive of hepatitis splenomegaly with grade 2 fatty liver and his portal vein was 12 mm so uh, and then he was uh, actually uh, referred to a gastroenterologist and an endoscopy was done which was suggestive of varices and that is how this gentleman was picked up to have a uh, uh, chronic liver disease with diabetes and is a non alcoholic and then he was evaluated for other causes finally other causes were negative and he was treated with uh, diabetes and obesity with chronic liver disease at this particular age and then he was uh, this gentleman was managed with diet and exercise very intensively uh, he was uh, repeatedly having a diet recall uh, sessions with a, a special attention by trained dietitians even exercise was planned by uh, Uh, structured uh, exercise was suggested to him so that he plans to lose weight and that is what he was uh, actually suggested and he was uh, referred to a specialist a trained specialist for exercise plan for weight reduction anti diabetic medications that will be beneficial for him are metformin azl2 inhibitors glp1 receptor agonists and even dpp4 pyoglitazone alpha glucosidase inhibitors even drugs like salicylazole has some benefits and finally you can use drugs like sulfonylurea with caution and insulin in this patient so the same patient uh, comes to the casualty after 3 years with hematemesis and history of malina and his blood sugar random was 450 mg per deciliter at this particular time he was admitted in intensive care unit is diagnosed to have cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension and he is not Uh, but he was not in hepatic encephalopathy his renal functions were also normal so this gentleman was admitted in the icu was given insulin infusion to control his diabetes and once the patient was stabilized and was taking means orally he can be shifted to oral anti diabetic drugs from insulin as needed and if he needs he can be added as a basal insulin along with the oral hypoglycemic agents at this stage of disease the risk of hypoglycemia is high because glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis both are impaired at this stage of disease so we need to counsel uh, regularly at this stage of disease the same patient develops later on ascites and asarca with hypoproteinemia his renal function is also impaired and his meal intake is also unpredictable and this patient should be put on multiple so at this stage of time we need to stop all his oral anti diabetic drugs he should be under close monitoring by a gastroenterologist for diabetes management he should be put on multiple doses of insulin small doses multiple doses are going to be helpful and uh, it can be easily monitored and diagnosed as well now the same patient was well controlled on insulin and dpp4 started developing frequent hypoglycemia even on stopping insulin completely so at this stage always think about if the patient is uh, started uh, getting uh, hypoglycemia with the uh, dose which he was tolerating well we should think of hepatoma and we should screen for hepatoma in such patients especially hepatocellular carcinoma do test and evaluate it because if you see this uh, uh, association of diabetes and cancer is hepatic uh, cancers are very very high the odds ratio is 2.54 and the risk ratio is 2.50 very very high in diabetic patients and if you see the cancer mortality also uh, uh, in different study group the hepatic uh, cancer has got a very very high mortality so it's very important that when a patient you have some clinical signs uh, which suggest uh, of, uh, frequent hypoglycemia you should always rule out hepatoma in such patients and the same patient if you undergoes liver plant, uh, transplant later post transplant there is an increase in insulin resistance and most of the anti diabetic drugs can be used uh, with some caution on sulfonylurea to the drug interactions with the chemo, uh, chemotherapeutic agents which they have been prescribed later on 
So this is how a patient should be followed up uh, if uh, different stages of management of chronic liver disease with diabetes. And this is the flowchart of management, treatment of NICE, and the control of other CV risk factors is very, very important because if you treat at this stage very, very intensively, we can actually prevent the progression of disease from NASH to uh, uh, fibrosis to cirrhosis of liver and further hepatocellular carcinoma. So metformin is one drug which has been very, very uh, useful and it may be particularly useful in obese patients in whom it may cause mild weight loss as well. The maximum dose should not exceed 1,500 milligram. There are some concerns about lactic acidosis uh, with uh, metformin therapy in chronic liver disease patients. So we should hold on uh, this drug in patients who have child puke uh, uh, C, uh, stage C, where the chances of lactic acidosis is very high. So patients with uh, child puke stage A and B can be put on metformin with a lower dose, not with the maximum dose. And Whenever you uh, we feel that the patient has got an active liver or a renal function is deteriorating, we should immediately stop it. In setting of acute illness and decompensation, it should be stopped. It is relatively contraindicated in patients with advanced liver disease or in binge drinkers because it may predispose to lactic acidosis. Sulfonylurea insulin citralagot should be avoided or used with caution in at low dose due to risk of hypoglycemia. As I said, they are put, uh, usually bound to the plasma proteins and hypoproteinemia is very, very close, uh, common uh, phenomenon in patients with chronic liver disease. So this drug should be avoided as far as possible. In severe hepatic disease, it should be completely avoided. Lower doses, especially the shorter acting drugs like lipizide and glycoside can be preferred in child puke class A and B and should be definitely avoided in class C. Sulfonylurea with a short high flight such as glipizide or glycolizide are preferred in these patients. Alpha glucosidase uh, inhibitors are uh, like a carbose and voglubose may be particularly useful in patients with liver disease because they act directly on the GI tract to decrease carbohydrate absorption, thereby decreasing postprandial hyperglycemia. It is relatively safe and could be used without any dose modification in CLD patients, preferred in child puke class A and B and not in class C. So this is again a very good, uh, you can actually add on a carbose along with even insulin and low doses of metformin. Piazolin diendions, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. Rosiglitazone is no more available in our country. The, the, if you uh, remember, uh, the first drug was troglitazone, which was removed from the market because of the severe hepatic toxicity. And later on, there was a big concern regarding uh, other thiazoline diagnosis and the hepatic toxicity. So pioglitazone was uh, studied and more than 20,000 patients. In, this is a Japanese study. And there was no case report of hepatic failure in more than 20,000 patients. So, and even uh, after uh, using for more than 10 years, we have hardly case reports of pioglitazone and liver disease. So it's a very, very safe drug in patients uh, with uh, liver disease. It should be used in child puke class A. In case of active or acute liver disease, it should be avoided and it should be avoided in patients with liver enzymes more than three times normal. And once the enzymes comes to normal values and patient doesn't have a decompensated liver disease, it can be started again. It is contraindicated in case of hepatic insufficiency and uh, uh, in any stage of hepatic insufficiency. Pioglitazone is known to improve NASH over, uh, there are a lot of data, and this is the only drug which has been FDA approved to be used in NASH. But important thing is the level of enzyme should not be more than three times when you start this particular therapy. This is very, very important. And once the enzyme levels have come down with diet and exercise, weight reduction, you can start this drug, 30 milligram. DPP-4 inhibitors are again a good class of drugs, Glyptins, Cita, Vilda, Lina, Saxa, these are all available. Today we even have Evogliptin and Tenelagliptin. So except Vilda Glyptin, DPP-4 can be used in child puke class A and with caution in class B. This is very, very important. We should not use Vilda Glyptin. Vilda Glyptin has got some hepatotoxicity been reported and definitely not in class C. So DPP-4 inhibitors can be used in child puke class A if at all needed, even with along with metformin and DPP-4, even you can add a basal insulin if you need a better control of blood sugar. 
GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have beta dexamethasone, beta glutide, dulapotide, sunabutide. They all are uh, useful drugs in patients with NASH, weight reduction, and they all we have data from in six months with liraglutide, and this was after six months of liraglutide. So this is one good drug which can be used in patients with NASH because uh, this is one drug which has been documented to actually take care of NFLD. SGLD2 inhibitors like dapagliflozin, canagliflozin, and ampagliflozin. We have uh, some data with ampagliflozin, and there was a significant reduction in fat content from the baseline uh, with the ampagliflozin. This was a study which was published in 2018, and there are a lot of data which are coming up in NFLD and uh, diabetes with ampagliflozin. We have some data uh, again that the percentage change in liver fat related to baseline as assessed by MRI PDDF is a significant difference in the change in liver fat between the two groups. So you can, uh, there is a 30% improvement in the liver fat with ampagliflozin. And uh, the baseline, uh, the, the baseline changes, sorry, the baseline change in the enzymes is also very, very significant. So ampagliflozin has shown to be very, very beneficial in patients with NASH and could be a good drug of choice early when it started early in obese type 2 diabetic with NASH. And uh, we still need to have data for uh, re reducing the progression of the disease from NASH to cirrhosis. Even dapagliflozin, there is a data published uh, which significantly reduced liver fat accumulation associated with the decrease in abdominal subcutaneous fat in patients with inadequately controlled type 2 diabetes. So this is again a uh, 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 good data with dapagliflozin and other SGLT2 inhibitors useful in management uh, uh, for NASH and uh, prevention of progression of NASH to CLD. Again, we have another data with comparison of ipragliflozin and pioglutazone in the management and it can very clearly says that the uh, uh, ipragliflozin and other SGLT2 inhibitors can be beneficial even when compared to uh, pioglutazone in the long run as far as reduction of fat content in the liver is concerned. Insulin therapy is the mainstay in the treatment of uncontrolled diabetics from single dose of basal in, uh, insulin to multiple dose of basal insulin may be needed. Insulin is anti-inflammatory. Insulin has got in patients with uh, uncontrolled diabetes and hypertriglyceridemia, and insulin is uh, does not have any uh, contraindication as far as hypoproteinemia or uh, no, no drug interaction as far as other drugs used in chronic liver disease is concerned. The only problem is we uh, hypoglycemia is a concern. Severe hypoglycemia is a very big concern with insulin therapy. So we need to have uh, good SMBG or CGMs, uh, frequent CGMs in patients with chronic liver disease and insulin therapy. Patients who have ascites, patients who have anasarcitis, very important if they are injecting subcutaneous insulin, they should inject over arms instead of abdomen and thighs. This again should be uh, discussed with the patients when advising insulin therapy. Insulin requirement, however, may vary. For example, in patients with decompensated liver disease, the requirement may decrease due to reduced capacity for gluconeogenesis and reduced hepatic breakdown of insulin. However, patients with impaired hepatic function may have an increased need for, for insulin due to insulin resistance. So this is again a very important uh, message that insulin requirement can vary with different patients. Careful glucose monitoring and frequent dose adjustments of insulin may be necessary. So hypoglycemia is very important and is very uh, common in decompensated cirrhotics. And if a patient starts getting frequent hypoglycemia, hepatoma, hepatocellular carcinoma should be ruled out. So to conclude, diabetes mellitus is observed in up to 30% of patients with cirrhosis and diabetes can be either an underlying type 2 diabetes mellitus or the consequence of alterations directly related to an impaired liver function. Diabetes mellitus is associated with a poor prognosis in patients with cirrhosis, mainly because of an increased risk of cirrhosis complications. Thus, screening for diabetes mellitus should be proposed to all patients with cirrhosis. And although it is tempting to speculate that controlling diabetes may have a beneficial effect, further control studies are needed to evaluate the effects of diabetes control on the development of complications of cirrhosis. So I thank you all for your patient listening. 
and i thank the organizers for this particular opportunity